morning. Good morning. We're so glad you're with us today in person. We are so glad that those of you who join us online are here with us. It is a beautiful day outside. A little warm for services at 8.30 outside, but just a beautiful, beautiful day for us to be together. There's some folks who uh, have not been with us for a while who are starting to, to come back and feel more comfortable, and we're so glad of that. For those of you who are not quite ready yet, it's completely okay. You come at your level, but we miss you, all right? Uh, I wanted to just say a few things to start the service with. One, uh, we're in the season of Pentecost, which is that time uh, when on Pentecost Sunday we celebrated the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church to infuse them with power and spirit. And I wore a few of my red stoles, and I cannot tell you how many comments I got from folks going, you know, I really like it when you wear a stole. Uh, it's really kind of cool. You usually just do it uh, during communion. And, and so I wanted to wear one again today. Uh, this one... This is my father's. It was made for him in 1973 by Helen Relaford, who was a, uh, a beautiful spirit, a beautiful woman who made stoles for everyone who got ordained in that annual conference. And she did them all the way up to the very early 90s. Uh, I was ordained in 93, and she had stopped doing it by that point. She just wasn't able to. Uh, and so this one, 1973. Uh, made for my father. So in honor of Father's Day, uh, to all the fathers, uh, I wanted to wear this, but particularly to mine. I love you, Dad. Um, how about uh, just a couple of little notes. Uh, today and every Sunday, you do not have to have reservations anymore. Just show up, be with us. That's a great thing. Uh, also, once you're seated, please feel free, if you're comfortable, to take your mask off. You do not need to have it on uh, in this space unless you choose to. So welcome to worship. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, it is a beautiful, beautiful June day. In the midst of creation, we hear the birds sing, we see the clouds move, we see the glory of the trees shaking. There is so much life in our world. The last year and a half have been tough, and it's felt like it's been difficult to fully engage with life at times, but you were present with us through all of it, just as you are present with us today, as we gather to worship, to praise your name, to hear a word, to pray prayers that you already know about, but we lift up, and then to be sent again out into the world. Bless this time together, O oh God as we work to bless and honor you. Amen. We will begin our service with the litany that is uh, on your screen. I will read the leader parts, and you will read the congregational parts. The Spirit descends like a dove, bringing peace to unite the world in a just and caring community. The Spirit comes like a breath, bringing life to renew the people of God. The Spirit spreads like fire, bringing energy for witnessing to the love of God. Spirit of the living God, come to us and transform our lives by your power. Come, come Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit come. come. Amen, amen and amen. And amen. No. 
wow. Beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you all for that. One of the things that we do as a congregation each week together is we say together the statement of faith that tells the world and reminds us of who we are and how we're called to live in the world. We believe that the way we treat one another is the fullest expression of how we live out our faith. We find our approach to God through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, who is our model for living. And we recognize the faithfulness of other paths, which may also lead people to an experience of God. We stand in God's grace, and we live that grace in our attitudes and actions toward one another. We understand the church as a community of people who together make up the body of Christ as we strive to serve the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. We are inclusive as Christ was and welcome all people seeking a closer relationship with God. We believe that the questions are as important as the answers, that living the mystery is a more sacred position than church tradition and doctrine. And we strive to love all, serve all, in Jesus' name, as we proclaim our mystery of faith, that Christ died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. As for today, for our reflection time, uh, it was pretty easy to choose. It's a song that I have liked for a long time. It's called Calm the Storm.
often when I don't feel very calm, when I have a storm raging around me, I'll listen to the song, and it gives me a sense of peace and an understanding that God is with us no matter what. I want to talk to the kids and the families for just a little bit today for our kids' time. And I mentioned at the first of the service that I was going to wear a stole today. And some people don't quite understand what the purpose of stoles is. So I want to go back uh, a long time ago uh, in the time of Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter. That meant he made things, right? He, he may have made tables or chairs or maybe even, uh, you know, storage areas, places where you could put things. Maybe he made uh, dishes. We're not sure exactly what he made. But there's one sort of myth, you know, like a legend about Jesus, that he and his father had a very, very famous and amazing carpentry shop because they did something that was the most intricate, the, the craziest, the most difficult carpentry, carpentry that there was, that they made yokes for animals, right? And when you are uh, a farmer or you're a business person and you're moving stuff from one place to the other, you often had it uh, in like a wagon of some kind. And it would be pulled by oxen, uh, sometimes other animals, but oxen was the one that was the most softened. And uh, so let's say John has this farm and he's gonna uh, take his stuff to market and he has two oxen and he needs them to lead. Well, you have to design the yoke that goes over two oxen exactly to the shape of the two oxen. It has to have the same weight, it has to have the same uh, distance so that the oxen can pull together. If the yoke is not perfect, the oxen, oxen uh, uh, cannot, cannot walk, uh, work together. So when Jesus started telling people that he wanted them to, uh, to be his disciples and that people started coming to him, uh, you know, we think he kind of left that behind. But it's this cool story that says that Jesus was an amazing, just perfect kind of carpenter. And we think about what it means to be yoked. It means that you've been asked to carry something heavy a long time ago. Bishops and pastors started putting stoles around pastor's neck. Part of it was just acknowledge that we were under the direction of Jesus, that this yoke pulled us, just like oxen in old days. Not a great image, I know. Uh, but that was how we were led to, to lead our people. And when you are ordained, you get a bunch of heads put on, hands put on your head, you know, when you're becoming a pastor. And they put that stole around you and they say, take this yoke upon you and go and preach the gospel. Take care of the sick and love all. It's an amazing thing to put it on because it reminds me of that day when a bishop put his hands on me and my father, who was a United Methodist pastor, stood there too. So did my mother. And they got to lay hands on me when I was ordained. So to have on this stole today, to remember those moments... It reminds me of who I'm called to be, but it also reminds me of my dad. And I know you probably are going to have a good day celebrating maybe a dad or an uncle or a stepdad, maybe a grandfather. If not, and it makes you a little sad, that's okay too. Just note that you're loved and that God is there for you always. Let's pray. God, you call us to place a yoke around our shoulders so that we can lead the people and so that the people can see who you sent to be with them. God, you also place a call on everybody's lives, Sunday school teachers and council members, people who write the checks and clean the floors, all of those people who make this church work so that we can be there for the next generations. God, be with these children, with their parents and their teachers as they end this school year so that they may know your love and be able to come into a summer to take off and begin to get more normal. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. through the gospel of Mark 
There are things I love about Mark, usually some very straight, very concise language so you know exactly what's going on. He uses the word immediately 73 times, 42 times in the first couple of chapters. He wanted people to know that Jesus was responsive, that Jesus was there. He's telling this story about Jesus who, who doesn't go away. But every once in a while, we get this pause, and Jesus does need to get away. The crowds have gathered around him. He's fed them. He's healed people, and for a moment, he needs a break. This is one of those stories where the disciples say to Jesus, we need to go to the other side of the lake. There are people here that are pressing upon you. Let's go break for a little bit. And it's in that moment that we get this story. It's a story about a boat. Now, I want everyone who is in here to look up at the ceiling. Those of you who are not here, our ceiling is the shape of a boat hull. If you look at it, almost every church is. Many of them have beams to remind us of the wood planks in the ship. This is a tradition that has gone back generations and generations that we are the ship. We are guiding God's people in the ship, and, and Christ is stirring this boat. He's steering us in the right directions. This is a moment when chaos looms and Jesus sleeps. Matthew 4, verse 35 through 41. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took with him, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him up, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let us pray. Holy God, bless the reading and the hearing of your holy word, but especially this day, O oh God. Bless its doing. Amen. Anyone in the room or online who has never been in a boat that was in the midst of a storm is really missing something. I mean, if you, if you are, you get to pray and get closer to God, closer to Jesus in that moment. Uh, maybe you get seasick and that's not a very pleasant thing. Maybe the boat makes you so insecure that you're really feeling like, I'm about to die. Maybe you've just hit a, a rough patch of weather and you've moved through it. Storms rage around us all the time. Right now, in the western part of the U.S. and other parts of the world, it is 100 degrees by 8 a.m. Drought is stricken them. They're struggling with the lack of storm. In the southeastern part of the U.S. and around the Gulf, we are continually seeing during this season hurricanes and other storms that are whipping up and causing damage. There are storms around us on a regular basis. Growing up in the Midwest and in Texas, saw lots of tornadoes. Up here, you guys, more hurricanes than I have ever experienced in my life. Storms rage around us all the time. Over the last year and a half, it has felt like we were going through one tropical storm after the other. Uh, an ice freeze, an ice storm, a snowstorm, COVID, jobs being lost, restaurants and businesses closing their doors, maybe for the very last time, grandchildren that were born that grandparents were not able to see for months and months into their life, 
family that were going through significant illness and no one could go and be with them. There have been storms raging around us all of our lives. Sometimes we notice them and sometimes we don't. Small times, uh, sometimes they're like small little blips on the radar and we think, yeah, that was kind of tough, but we got through it. And sometimes they have been massive storms that you felt were swamping the boat that you were in. It was about to sink. Over the last 15 months, things have gone from bad to worse at times. We're beginning to see some way forward and to see some possibilities of getting back to normal, but nobody knows what normal looks like anymore. Is in this time period with COVID in a political election, Black Lives Matter and protests all around the country and around the world after George Floyd was killed. Opportunities that were lost in trying to help everyone move through these moments because of political divides. Even masks and vaccines have become politicized. Into all of this mix, it just continues to add and add and add to the storms around us. The boat that they were in was crossing what is often called the Sea of Galilee. Some people call it Lake Genesaret, all right? But the truth is, it's a pretty big body body of water, but it's very shallow. It is not a deep sea. It is not at all. So when wind begins to whip across the land and it gets to this body of water, it can stir up the water really easily and waves will begin to pick up. Now, don't think about a big ship that they were on. It was probably a fishing boat, maybe about 15, 20 feet long, maybe six feet wide, four feet wide. It depended on what kind of uh, of fishing they were doing, whether it was a net or some other way. And they're there on that, and and they see the storm begin to pick up, and it's like, I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. And they know that they need Jesus. I want to stop the story there for a minute. And when I tell you a story that I just learned about in the last couple of weeks, when I was applying to go to seminary, I applied to a number of United Methodist institutions, to Emory, Uh, in Atlanta, to Iliff, uh, in Denver, uh, to um, St. Paul's School of Theology uh, in Kansas City, and that's where I ended up. I've always had sort of this affinity for Emory. I have a number of pastoral friends who went there, and I've got a number of friends who teach there now. And the word Emory came up on a news article, and so I thought, oh, I'll read it. It caught my eye. It's a story of a man named Marion Hood. Marion Hood is 83 years old, and his life is sort of a testament to the storms that rage in our world. In 1959, Marion Hood was applying to go to medical school. He felt like this was his vocation, it was his call. When he was writing his admit letter, he was supposed to talk about what led him to become a physician, what was it that drove him. Along with tests and applications, he had to write a letter. And he told a story for when he was eight years old. Marion and his mother were heading to the doctor's office. Marion's mom was sick. Marion went with her. He's eight years old. He and his mom walked to the front door of the doctor's office. They hadn't lived in this community very long and began to open the door. And the person behind the desk quickly came out and ushered them out of the door and told them they needed to come in the back entrance. She said she'd meet them back there. They walked to the back of the building. It was early in the morning, maybe about 9 o'clock, he remembers. They brought them into a small cubicle that had this tiny little window. The room was completely empty except for some Coke crates, and they were told to sit there. 9 o'clock in the morning, they think fairly quickly, we'll get in, It's just not a great place to wait. It's the 1940s, early 1950s. It was sort of the way things were done. They sat there all day until 4.30. The nurse came in and said, all right, you can come out now. And Marion said to the white nurse, why do we have to wait so long? And she said, we don't see your kind 
until everyone else is out of the building. As he was sitting there listening to the doctor trying to take care of his mother as she was more and more frustrated, trying to explain what that felt like, Marion vowed in that moment that he was going to grow up and be a doctor, that he could take care of his mom and others of his kind, the language he used. So he graduated from Clark Atlanta University, a historic black university in the Atlanta area. And he began applying to medical school, as I told you. And so he applies at all these different places, sends his letter in. He gets into Loyola and I think another uh, medical school, I think it was Howard University. And he thought, I lived in Georgia. I'd like to go to Emory. I, I have just as good a chance as anyone else. He received a letter in the mail after he sent everything in. And the letter was not very full. You know that feeling when your children, your grandchildren are applying for universities and if they get this big envelope and packet you think they're in. And if it's a small envelope, you hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. He opened the letter and he said, uh, he read this, these words. Unfortunately, we are unable and unauthorized to allow anyone of the Negro race to come to our school. While your letter, your grades, and your test scores are above average, maybe even excellent, we cannot admit you to Emory. He took that letter and he saved it. Emory University, last Thursday, had their graduation ceremonies for their medical school. They asked Marion Hood if he would be there so that they could publicly apologize for what had happened to him in 1959. When he was interviewed about that, he said he was kind of nervous it was coming up and he wasn't sure what they were going to say or what was going to happen. And the interviewer said, hey, Marion, do you still have that letter? And he said, yes, I do. It used to hang in my office proudly so that I could talk to every intern and everyone who came in and thought about med school don't let anything stop you. Don't let any letter from somebody stop you. Go be who you're supposed to be. He still has that letter. No longer practicing. He's 83, as I said. That letter is in a frame downstairs in his basement so that only friends and family see it. He's kind of tired of explaining it. But when Emory asked him if they could do a public apology to him, he said yes. And they said, well, while you're here, while you're a part of the ceremony, we'd like to give you an honorary degree from Emory. And he said, no, thank you. You didn't want me then. I don't want it now. The president of Emory University and also the dean and vice president of the university who was over the medical school made an eloquent and beautiful speech apologizing for the systemic racism that kept Marion out of that school. They acknowledged that racism is a thing, that it's not just a thing now, that it's been a thing for all the generations before now. And Marion received a public apology. You know, it, it's amazing that in the midst of all those storms, in 1959, it gets rejected. You get into the 60s and the civil rights movement. You get into all of these up, you know, upheaval in the United States, and he lived through all of that, graduating cum laude from uh, a, a Loyola University. He had his own practice. He was a, a gynecologist and obstetrician. He said he, gave, he delivered probably thousands of babies over his life and inspired and talked to hundreds of folks considering going into medicine. In the midst of all that storm, he was a calm presence. We've been in a lot of storms lately, right? A lot of storms. Storms that feel good and storms that feel bad. Storms that sort of refresh us as, as we feel and the rain sort of gently laying on us, landing on us, and we feel that refreshing moment 
Storms where we know that we have to have some rain to end this drought. Storms that come up very, very suddenly and we've got to protect each other to try to find a way to care for one another. There are storms all around us. There are cultural storms. There are church storms. There are family storms. There are global storms. And it's hard for us to face them. None of us can face them alone, right? Even in the midst of our own private storms. We can't get those, through those moments alone. It literally takes a village to get us through some of our storms. Sometimes a small village, sometimes a major metropolitan area. The storms will continue. And the thing about this story, it's so profoundly helpful in us understanding what is going on. Jesus says, let's go to the other side of the water. Maybe the wind was already whipping and the disciples were a little bit nervous, but they get in the boat anyway. They begin across to do the obedient thing, to follow Jesus even into the sea in the night. And all of a sudden, the waves start building. The boat starts rocking. They're anxiety, their fear, their doubt begins to weigh down heavier and heavier and heavier, and they're like, help! Help us! We don't, we think we're going to die. Jesus, where are you? And they go to the back of the boat, and not only is he sleeping, but he's sleeping on a cushion, so he's sleeping really good. They wake him up. They said, don't you care? We're out here dying. While they're all standing right there, no story of anyone falling overboard. Just a rocky, rocky, rocky moment. And he stands up. He doesn't address them. He doesn't talk to them at all. He goes to the bow of the boat. And he raises his hand. This is, it doesn't say that, but this is what I think happened. He raises his hand and he says, Peace, be still. And the water gets calm and the wind blows out and all of a sudden they're in this calm and placid moment and instead of the disciples saying oh my gosh how powerful he is what an amazing messiah what an amazing teacher rabbi you have saved us they say who is this guy i mean seriously who is he how can he do this and these are disciples that have been with him for a while Cindy loves to call the disciples in Mark as the duh disciples. They just don't get it. This is one of those moments when they are told what they should understand, and Jesus looks at them and goes, Oh my gosh, you guys still don't get it? They were obedient, and he was a presence. And then he led them forward through that storm so they could continue on their ministry. You see, we're going to continue to have storms. Some of them violent, some of them small. Some that just impact you and your family, and some that will impact just thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. The number of COVID deaths just continues to climb. The number of businesses lost and employees that aren't going back to work yet. Businesses that can't reopen because of that. People who've lost loved ones, both to COVID, but also to lack of care during the time period when hospitals and doctor's offices were so very scary. We are still in the midst of a storm, but we can see the horizon, and on the horizon, there is clear water. We can see it out there. Our boat is floating. And yes, there's some rocky places, but we can see the calm water out there. Jesus took his disciples through the storm and into the calm and into added ministry that they were asked to do. You know, one of the things that I, I am always amazed by when I read a story like Mary and Hood, he could have been so bitter and so angry that he gave up on his dream. He could have been so rejected and isolated that he said, fine, I just don't want to deal with any of this anymore. But it made him stronger. It made him more determined. It made him more at peace to move into what his vision of his life was and the vocation 
that he believed God placed on his life. Not to wear a stole, but to wear a stethoscope around his neck and care for others. I cannot promise you anything. I can't promise you that there won't be storms in front of us. I can't promise that there won't be bad times. I can't promise any of that. Neither does Jesus. What the promise is, is if you are obedient and follow my way, if you are a disciple, if you continue to walk in the ways of faithfulness, I will be present with you in those storms. I'll calm them as I can, but I will never leave you alone to face the waves. He could have been bitter. The disciples could have been angry. We all could have reacted badly to little storms and big storms around us, but here is what I know. That sleeping in the back of that boat meant Jesus knew that anything's come up, he can handle it. He knew he could handle it because he's God's son. And the power of God in those hands to say, Peace! Be still! was going to be enough to save them all. May we rely on that peace. Whether we're in the belly of the ship, or we're at home, on vacation, at our workplace, that calls for obedience and calls for calm. We will get through the storms of life together. Amen.
time today, I want to begin with something that's new in our country, and that's a more widely celebrated Juneteenth. I grew up in Texas. This is the story. Juneteenth is the story of, uh, in, uh, on this date, 1965, 1865, uh, the word of the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the Civil War reached Texas, and that's when literally slavery was over in the form that we knew it at that time. We have not come as far as we should have since then. But in recognition of all of those who feel the depth and the weight of Juneteenth, we send you our love. Let us pray. God, on this day, we pause to honor you, to remind ourselves that you are present, that in the midst of all of our fear, you are with us that we are never alone. We come on this day that honors fathers, a day that is very complicated. God, we give you thanks for those who've been a part of our lives. We give you thanks for the lessons they taught and the ways that they have led. For those folks who have difficult relationships with their fathers, we ask for healing and continued growth and know and a full knowing that they are loved anyway. We pray for our schools as this school year ends. We pray for kids and parents and teachers everywhere. We pray, oh God, that those who have yet to be vaccinated, if they can, to please be vaccinated so that we can lessen the impact around the world. We pray prayers of peace. For Charlotte's friend Kevin, who got hurt and is in the hospital. For continued strength for Russell's daughter, Patty, who lost her home to a fire last week. For Alice Roth, who is released this week from Ebbingdon Hospital to return home to Southampton Estates. For the McMaster's family, yesterday we held the memorial service for Rich. For my dad, who's having his gallbladder removed on Thursday. For Walt and Kim and their family as they mourn the loss of Walt's father. For Ilsa Barron's sister Mara, who is now receiving hospice care. For all of those stuck in a cycle of addiction, for those in recovery and for their families. We pray prayers for Eric, Crystal, Kyle, and Garrett, and the entire Strauss family as they remember the loss of Amanda five years ago. We also sit with some joy this day. For Carolyn Wolf, whose cancer tumor markers are down significantly, and this is the first positive sign in a number of years. For Kelly and Anthony Anlis, who welcomed baby Leo this past week, a big congrats to them and to Jean and Rick Graber, their grand, uh, who are grandparents once again of a little boy. For Nancy Griffiths on this new great-grandchild. And for Luke Rockenbach and his family, who will be baptized a little bit later after this service. He is the great nephew of Carol Hankinson and the grandson of Joan Dunn. God, there is so much going on in our world. We pause 
to remind ourselves that you hold us in the palm of your hand, that you care for us in the midst of storms, that life has storms. We can't just not experience them. There are always ups and downs, joys and sorrows, mourning and new birth, that there are always problems that the world places in front of us, not to test our faith, but because that's the way the world works. Help us to remain steadfast, to continue to walk in the ways of faith, to continue to follow your son, Jesus Christ, who led his disciples, who calmed the seas, who took on our sins, was crucified, died, and resurrected. We unite with all the voices around the world, all the Christian voices that come together to pray this prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we move into this time of offering, this is that time of the year when people begin to go on vacations, and we hopefully will see some folks coming back as others begin to travel we have been so appreciative of all the gifts that you have given us throughout this year. It's usually a little slow time right now, so uh, we encourage you to continue your gifts as you're able, and we thank you for all of them. Those of you who are with us uh, by video uh, on live stream, you can mail in yours or do those donations online. Those of you who are here, there is an offering box on the back table that you can put yours into. Thank you all. Hold it all together, everybody needs a strong When life hits you out of nowhere, and it leaves you holding on And when you're tired of fighting, chained by your control It's freedom in surrender, lay it down and let it go So when you're on your knees, the answer seems so far away you're not alone, stop holding on and just be held. Your world's not falling apart, it's falling into place. I'm on the cross, stop holding on and just be held. Just be
answer seems so far away You're not alone, stop holding on and just be held Your world's not falling apart, it's falling into place I'm on the throne, stop holding on and just be held Just be held Just be held. Just be held. Just be held. Man. Before I'm before I move into the church news, I just want to say thank you to those folks who uh, have helped today. Yao Zhu and Chris and Dave Barber were outside at 8.30. Right now, we've got Yao Zhu, Daniela, uh, Lisa, Aiden, and Dave here. And we've got Mike and Cindy on the tech booth today. All right. One of the things that I, I just am enjoying right now is the sense of, of seeing people that I haven't seen in a while and just smiling when you see each other, you know. Um, it's just such a relief to begin to see that. Uh, at the 830 service, I saw some people that I have not seen since COVID began. I'm seeing some people the last few weeks that I've never, I haven't seen in a long time. It is so great to see you. And I'm going to say it again. If you're not ready to come back, we understand. But our boat's ready. <laughs> Our boat's ready. All right, let me tell you about a couple of things. This next Sunday is a very important Sunday in the life of the congregation. It is our congregational meeting, and it is at this congregational meeting when we approve our budgets. And the only way that we can approve our budgets is if we have a quorum of 100 people you know, online and in person. So let me tell you how next week is going to work. On Sunday morning, there will not be an 8.30 service. We're just doing a service at 10 o'clock. As always, it will be live streamed for those of you who are, are, are not ready to come back. So when we finish with the service, we'll begin to move downstairs where we will have box lunches. And about 1130, we're going to begin our meeting. Now, you can attend the congregational meeting either in person next week or we're going to have a Zoom. All that information will come to you, right? We sent an email out week before last. We're going to send another email out this week reminding you there's a couple of things we'd like for you to do in preparation. One, we need an RSVP if you're planning to have a box lunch with us. There are sign-up sheets on the back table. You can let us know if you have any dietary restrictions. And there is a sign-up sheet to sign up uh, for those meals online and through our constant contact. So go back to those and you can see that. We need to have that by tomorrow. They're trying to, to get the orders in so we make sure all that's done. So if you're planning on coming, if you're here, go ahead and sign up uh, for the number of box lunches you need. And if not, either call the office tomorrow uh, or sign up online. Now, um, next weekend, you also need to make sure that you have looked through the budgets as you've received them. We sent those out through Servant Keeper. Everyone ought to have them uh, by email. If you have not received them by email or, uh, you know, in a hand, uh, in a delivered mail item, uh, let us know in the office. We will have some available uh, next Sunday for those of you who are here, and we can put them up on the screen for those of you to join us uh, on Zoom. A couple of other things going on this week. Um, let's see, Tuesday at 1 o'clock, we're going to have our community conversation. Uh, we're uh, waiting in, in anticipation for all of your graduation photos. Anyone who's graduated in your life, if your dog graduated obedience school, send us a picture of your dog and their graduation, right? Uh, preschool, junior high, high school, college, grad school, trade school, whatever. Send us a picture and let us know about someone in your family. Maybe it's a grandson or a granddaughter. Maybe it's a, you know, your great aunt who went back to school. Uh, whoever it is, we want to celebrate that. And we will do that next Sunday as well. And we'll award the Ernie Gell Scholarship uh, to some of our seniors who are heading off uh, to college. So the other thing I want to let you know is next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we're going to have another of our hymn sings. Some of you have been on those before. Maybe some of you have not. They're done through Zoom. And Yaoju prepares uh, about four, I think, hymns. Uh, and we mute 
so that we can all sing together uh, through Zoom in our houses. And we do we have a good time. Just enjoy being together. So that's at 5 o'clock next Saturday. So a number of things going on. Groups are beginning and, and have been meeting in this building for a few uh, months, more and more as we get closer to, to today. But it's great to begin to see life come back into the building and into uh, all of these moments. You know... I've been through some storms too and I've been through some storms with some of you in the midst of some really difficult times and nothing got fixed miraculously but we got through it you got through it you, you, you're still healing from some of it some of you but we continue to move forward and for that I'm eternally grateful we're not alone you are not alone whatever that storm is raging around you you're not alone. And if you need a life vest, holler at us. we got a few we can throw your way. May you go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.